Uh, welcome to the program today. And we are very fortunate at Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, uh, a chapter of the National Audubon Society based in the Cleveland, Ohio, U.S. area, um, to work this month, the month of November, with Nature's Nursery Center for Wildlife Rehabilitation and Conservation Education. And this is a, a wildlife rehabilitation center located in White House, Ohio, which is in the northwest quadrant of the Ohio, state of Ohio. And uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, every Friday during this month presentations led by Jamie Forbush, who is the education director at the center. Uh, last Friday we had what uh, the topic was, What Nature's Nursery Gives. And, uh, and today we're going to be talking about what do mammals give. And this is all under the umbrella of that, the idea that everyone has something to give. Uh, this is also in conjunction with um, a uh, featured fundraiser for the month. The WCAS uh, is helping to co-host with Nature's Nursery uh, because you may or may not know um, that with all of the uh, COVID distancing uh, and climate change and uh, economic and social changes that are going on right now, rehabilitation centers, whether it's um, you know in another part of the country or in your uh, your area, need uh, need support. And wildlife rehabilitation specialists are some of today's, like we say, unsung heroes and heroines, and they continue to work under tremendous pressure to continue to aid and assist injured wildlife despite what we say are the crippling effects of climate change now compounded by the social and economic complications of COVID-19. So welcome everyone and um, we're going to, I'm going to just go for a second. Uh, you can see our title and welcome slide there. And we're going to go to the next slide. I want you to know about the different programs and the schedule. Uh, as I said, November last uh, uh, um, Friday, we had What Nature's Nursery Gives. Today, we're going to be talking about What Do Mammals Give? Then next Friday, What Do Reptiles and Amphibians Give? And we'll close the month with What Do Birds Give? So I hope that you will consider uh, to give a donation uh, to uh, Nature's Nursery Center in White House, Ohio. And here is the link for how to do that. You can go directly to natures-nursery.org website and go there directly to give uh, a, a, a donation that will be deposited directly into the Nature's Nursery bank account. Or you can send a check. And you can send a check to Post Office Box 2395, White House, Ohio, 43571. And now we're going to go right away to uh, Jamie Forbush. And good morning, Jamie. I'm going to um, uh, share your screen now. And hang on just a moment. Um, and so that we can get the full view of you and your program. So welcome and thank you. The program's all yours. Hello, like you said, I'm Jamie. I'm the Education Director here at Nature's Nursery. And last week I kind of talked about how we've been coping and what we've, what kind of animals we've taken in this year and the amount of animals. Um, I would like to say the follow-up, we're at less than um, 60 animals in rehab right now. We just released, released a bunch of squirrels and the last of our pet baby opossums. So that's exciting. Um, just a couple more animals left, and hopefully our with summer, or I guess our summer season will finally end up closing, and we'll just have a couple animals here. Um, we do have 34 ambassadors, and I actually have four of them with me today. And um, our first one that I'm going to bring out and talk about um, is one that I've never taken on a program before, so we'll see how he go, how he does. Um, he might be crazy and bouncing off the walls, or he might hide the entire time, so we'll see. Um, but uh, he doesn't, he's so new he doesn't even have a name yet, um, so that's a little exciting. Actually, I can take this off because I'm in my room by myself. Um, but, so it's really exciting. We'll see how he does.
Looks like he's going to hide. But I'll see if you guys... It's hard to do it on the computer screen, but he might focus that out a little bit. So in here we actually have a fl southern flying squirrel. And the southern flying squirrel, like I said, doesn't have a name yet, but he came to us as an adult. We actually have two of them that came in as adults. Uh, from the Lake Erie um, Nature and Science Center uh, is where we got them. Um, they didn't have a space form or they wanted a second opinion. I don't remember um, exactly, but uh, we did notice that this guy does have a neurological issue. Um, he's popping out right now, so you might be able to see him. And um, so flying squirrels uh, are very, very fast animals. Um, you may notice with this little guy, he keeps kind of um, popping, is what we call it, or popcorning. Um, it's, it's a very technical term, right? Um, but uh, there really isn't a word for it, but he does like to, when he runs, instead of being very smooth, and fast running. He actually pops up in the air, um, and that's a neurological disorder. There's nothing we can do to fix that, unfortunately. So he will be in our care for the rest of his life, um, also with his buddy. Um, so there's two of them that did come in, both males. Um, they're very social creatures, um, so they don't do well by themselves. We, so we always want, if we have one flying squirrel, we want to quickly get another one, um, because they do live in those social groups. Now, um, flying squirrels, they're nocturnal, and actually, in Ohio, we don't have northern flying squirrels. We have the southern flying squirrels, uh, which is a little bit strange. So northern flying squirrels are more north in Canada. Um, there's little spots that go into the United States, some are in Michigan, but the southern flying squirrel is on the eastern half of the United States. Oh. He keeps popping back out and in before I can show you guys. Um, but uh, so the southern flying squirrel is on the eastern portion of the United States. And they're very important to our environment because they like to uh, collect acorns and seeds and nuts. So those aren't littering the ground. Um, if they, those seeds and nuts were littering the ground, uh, it would invite more rodents like mice. Uh, their population would greatly increase. So the fact that these little squirrels take those nuts and seeds and store them into trees um, prevents those mice from um, having that food source. Uh, so that's very important. Also, the, what you don't think about are there are flying squirrels everywhere. <laughs> um, there are some people who say they're the most common squirrel um, in the United States. And um, you just don't see them because they're nocturnal. So they have really big eyes that are very dark um, that help them see better at night. So they have more rods than cones in their eyes. So rods are what help um, people see in the grayscale, and cones are what allow people to see in color. And if you have more rods, it actually helps your night vision. So a lot of nocturnal species have more, more of those rods. And... <laughs> We have a stick in there, and he keeps, as he's moving around, it's scraping and making this little high-pitched squeaking noise. <laughs> but, um, so, uh, a lot of people confuse them with sugar gliders, and so sugar gliders are something that people can have as pets in the United States. They're an exotic animal. Um, but sugar gliders are actually more closely related to a kangaroo than they are to flying squirrels, even though they look very similar. And it's just because their species uh, kind of, they didn't ever diverge. So this flying squirrel is very unrelated to sugar gliders, which are from a completely different country. They just look similar. Um, and what's really cool, and I was so excited when we finally got flying squirrels in to test it for myself, but the coolest thing I have ever learned, I think, is that they glow pink underneath UV light. It is very interesting. Um, so immediately, as soon as we got them, I made sure to come really late at night to shine the UV lights on them. And sure enough, yes, they do go pink. So it's super cool. Um, and Amy, may, may I, in, this is Betsy, may yeah. I interrupt you just a second? Yeah, no problem. Uh, and uh, I want to welcome Brianna here. Brianna, if you have a question, uh, feel free to ask it or write it in the chat. 
and and I will see it and I will ask Jamie. But Jamie, do go on. Tell us how do they glow pink? Yeah. So they do. They have um, basically this fluorescence, fluorescence like chemical inside of their fur, and it helps them glow. It's very strange. Um, and oddly enough, a lot of nocturnal animals have this. Um, so we've even tried on our Virginia opossum. Um, she also glows pink. Um, it's something that um, nocturnal animals have. Not all of them, but some of them. Um, especially, I mean, like the flying squirrels and the opossum. But animals that come out at night, something that I recently learned, so I don't know too much about it, but I really want to go more and do more research on it um, to see if there are any studies done. Uh, that kind of explain it a little bit better, but they think it might relate to um, showing other flying squirrels where other flying squirrels are or somehow communicating through that fluorescence. Um, even uh, locating like food sources sometimes, somehow that relates to it. There's a lot of theories on why. I haven't found a definitive reason why they do this. Uh, Jamie, may I ask, uh, are, so are the flying squirrels, are they native to the state of Ohio or like what's their range and uh, and did they originate here domestically? Uh, so they didn't originate here domestically. They were native, they are, they are native species. Um, so they weren't a loose captive um, animal like you have like red-eared sliders that have kind of invaded our local water systems. No, they're a true native species, and uh, their range um, is in the United States. Southern flying squirrel, their range is, um, actually I have a photo on my computer to kind of show the different ranges of northern flying squirrels and southern flying squirrels. Um, but if you take a picture of North America, um, flying squirrels are probably one-third of the map to east. So from where we are, we have the southern flying squirrels. And then for northern flying squirrels, if you look at the map again of the North America, um, Canada, and then a little bit down into the United States with more in the Rocky Mountains. So they go actually more south in the Rocky Mountains, um, which is pretty interesting. Uh, but yeah, we don't have northern flying squirrels here, just southern flying squirrels. And I can't tell the difference between them. They look exactly the same to me. <laughs> um, but... Uh, they also eat not only nuts and seeds, but they also eat insects. So they do prey on things like crickets, grasshoppers, and more of those nighttime insects that you um, hear a lot during the summer. Um, they even eat fungi uh, and lichen that might be on the trees. And they also consume uh, eggs sometimes from birds and carrion. So they are pretty much opportunistic is the word I would use with them. They eat pretty much anything they And then, um, yeah, I don't really know what eats them. I never found that. Um, like I said, he is a new creature. They are new critters that we have, so I have to do more research on them. But I would assume if they, something did prey on them, it would be owls um, or nocturnal predators, so maybe some fox. Um, coyote. Uh, we usually get them here at Nature's Nursery because they've fallen out of the nest, the young have, or somebody cut down a tree and then, then later on found the young. Uh, but for the most part, we don't typically get in adults um, unless they're neurological like these guys and they just bump around everywhere. Um, but they are incredible animals. I am forever fascinated by these creatures. Just watching him now, I wish he wasn't hiding, but he'll keep poking his head out and watching me and then hiding back in as soon as I look at him. Um, so it's, uh, it's amusing, and I like just watching their antics, especially because they're social. And at our center, we don't house multiple species together. We just think it's, that's room for uh, lots of things happening. So we try to keep them separated. But with flying squirrels in particular, because they're so social, we have to put them with others of their species. Um, so just watching their antics and their interactions with each other is kind of amusing. Wow. But well, oh, if I, I may, thank you. That's so interesting. Uh, now, I don't want to interrupt you, but I do want to, again, welcome uh, everyone who is here joining us at the program. 
And uh, if anyone has a question, please just unmute yourself and ask. I don't think Jamie will mind if you if you politely ask her a question. And or you can write your question in the chat. You find the chat uh, icon and use the chat toolbar to uh, write your question in it. And uh, I'm happy to communicate it to Jamie if you prefer. All right. Well, let us continue. Again, if you have have a question or a comment, uh, just let us know in the chat or unmute yourself. Uh, there are also um, icons, emoti emoticons that can be used here that you can post in the chat for for uh, feedback. And I hope and encourage you as well for the attendees, if you'd like to um, to uh, turn your video on so we can see you. And it makes it much more fun and interactive. If, if you feel like it. All right. Thank you. Keep going on, Jamie. Oh, yeah. So here's our next friend. Let's see if you can see him. Oh, let me actually close the blind. That might help things a little bit. There we go. So here we have Bruce. Um, his full name is Bruce Wayne. And he is a big brown bat. So Bruce has been with us for almost seven years now. And he came to us as an orphan um, during a period of time where um, the state wasn't allowing us to release big brown bats um, that came in as orphans just because we didn't have proper ways to um, figure out basically if we knew they would be successful in the wild. So how do you teach a bat how to hunt using echolocation? Um, well, research has been done, and now people know how to do it. Um, basically, you can't beat instincts. Their instincts can pretty much do it on their own. Um, we do send them to another facility temporarily just to um, teach them. Basically, they put them in a large unit where the bats can fly around, and then they release insects that the bats can then hunt. Um, and it's very special and technical, and we don't have the ability to do that here at our center. Um, so we rely on other nature centers to kind of help other animals um, be successful in the wild. We want to make sure that they can pass their tests. We want to make sure that they know how to fly. Um, and we want to make sure that they know how to hunt before we release those animals. So here's Bruce Wayne. Um, again, he's an orphan. Um, we've had him. He's never been in the wild. Um, a little personal uh, history behind him is that uh, he's... He's, he's on a diet is a nice way of putting it. Um, so he's a little overweight for a big brown bat. And Bruce, um, he pretty much whatever we put in his food dish he'll eat, um, which can be very detrimental come winter because bats, even though he's in captivity, his body is telling him to slow his, um, his metabolism down. And when they do that, they gain weight very fast. And so with Bruce, we had to actually limit his diet, where our other bat, um, Ferguson, who is also a big brown bat, he's 20 years old. And uh, Bruce, um, uh, or Ferguson, unlike Bruce, knows how to basically use portion control, um, where Bruce does not. So he's on a diet. He actually looks a little overweight right now, so he's very chunky. Um, but these are super, super cool critters. So. Uh, Bruce, if he was in the wild, uh, would eat roughly 500 insects an hour um, and up to about 8,000 a night is generally how much they would consume. And so they're catching tons of mosquitoes, if you can imagine that. So about think of 8,000 mosquitoes being eaten every single night by one bat. And now that's not, and that's talking about just the males. So female bats, they're raising their pups. And so they need to consume much more than that 8,000 in order to feed themselves and make the milk for their young. And so they are super important to our environment because they're eating those insects like mosquitoes that pass on West Nile or malaria and all those other diseases that you can think of. But these guys are protecting us by consuming those, those insects. So big brown bats, 
are probably the most common bat you'll find. Um, they kind of have learned to grab humans. Um, other bats, not so much. So we do have, I believe, around 13 bats in the whole state of Ohio. Um, I know in our county, which is Lucas County, there's 10 species that have been discovered or found here of the 13 in Ohio. Um, there are three, I think, that are found just in southern Ohio, not northern. But big brown bats um, are the most common. And then there's little brown bats, which look like big brown bats babies with how small they are. And these guys are already pretty tiny. And they also are in trouble. So bats have a lot of hurdles to overcome. They're very good at dodging things, so they don't get hit by cars or anything. Um, but they do have trouble finding places to roost and have their young. So a lot of people will find them in their barns, and they don't like that. And that's typically where bats can find homes now. So um, think about pretty much where your house is. It used to be part of a forest, where your schools, your grocery stores, um, any building. It all used to be part of a forest, and now that's been fragmented, so they do have to cross those roads. And bats are typically a forest-dwelling animal, so they, when they go over those roads, it leaves them open to things like predators, like owls who might be hunting those bats. It just gives them less of an area to really hide. And then bats also are suffering from a fungus. Um, it's called white nose syndrome. Um, I feel like a lot of people kind of know about it now. Um, but white nose syndrome is a airborne fungus is how it spreads. And it may have just been on a hiker. So white nose actually came from um, Europe. And the bats in Europe know how to clean it off themselves. So it doesn't bother them. But the bats here, that's not something they've learned how to do. It's also very hard for them to do because this white nose fungus not only attaches to their nose and goes down into their throat, it also covers their ears and any place that doesn't have fur, really. Um, it's called white nose syndrome uh, because it's typically found around their nose and it does prevent them from breathing. And so during winter, they might suffer from that. Um, it passes from one critter to the next very easily. Um, they're typically going to be found um, in the wild under certain trees, like shagbark tree. So shag bark tree kind of sounds like it, um, like the word, it's kind of shaggy. And so the bats can tuck themselves up underneath that. Uh, these bats don't typically migrate, so that's, that tree is very important for them. Um, they might find homes in people's barns, under bridges now. Um, we actually got a call earlier uh, about a whole bunch of bats in someone's attic that they were asking how to humanely remove. Um, and you have to do it during the right time of year because you can't do it in the spring. The bats are already sleeping, or during the winter, the bats are sleeping, so you're not going to remove them. And then during uh, the spring and summer and early fall, you have bats raising babies. So if you block them and they can't get back in, those babies are unfortunately not going to survive. So there's a small window in like August, the end of September, August, um, where you can actually install these one-way doors um, where the bats can get out, but then they can't get back in. And so we do a lot of educating on that because a lot of people just don't want them in there at all, and we'll just automatically put it up any time of the year, and then we end up with a whole bunch of orphan baby bats. So there's Bruce. Well, that's very, very good. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, now, Brianna, it's so nice to see you here today. Now, where are you from? I'm not hearing you. Um, I see that you are unmuted. Hang on just a minute, Jamie. Mm -hmm. No, I'm still not able to hear you. Darn. <laughs> Well, Brianna, welcome, and if you have a question or a comment, please write it in the chat so we can share it. We're going to go on now. All right, Jamie, please go on. Yeah, please ask any questions. I'm fine being interrupted at any time. It's, I'm very casual, and I'm, I just like interacting with people. <laughs> it makes it more 
Oh, okay, very good. Uh, Brianna has written, she's from Texas, but she's currently living in Virgin Virginia in the DC metro area. Well, thank you for sharing that and we're delighted you could join us and we hope you'll join us again. Okay, Jamie, well, all yours. So I actually have to get on the floor for a second to get this one out because he's being grumpy. Um, so he's very early and he's one that has a very large personality is the way I'll put it. Alright, so that's going to take me a minute to grab. Hey bud. So I have a bunny. I don't know how well you can see him in the video. He's very dark. Uh, so I use the Roman for special, um, for a very special reason. So he is a domestic rabbit, and Roman, uh, we actually rescued him from the Wood County Humane Society um, because uh, they got in a whole bunch of rabbits from somebody who wasn't taking very good care of them, and we actually lost our previous education rabbit, um, and we needed a new one. So we got him. Um, he's very, very ornery. Um, he likes to hide. He doesn't enjoy his job very much, unfortunately. But he loves all the treats that we give him. Um, and he does enjoy hiding in the weirdest places. So we let him hop around um, during the day. We actually had to set up a pen for him to play in. Because if we didn't set up the hen pen, he would hide behind a like, computer desk. And we couldn't get him out. So we had to wait for hours for him to eventually work his way out from behind the computer desk. Or he'd hide under bird cages, or just basically he'd cause trouble and hide under things. Uh, but we've used Roman specifically because we cannot take Eastern Cottontail rabbits on programs. And um, for a very good reason. So the state even doesn't allow it. And that's because Eastern Cottontail rabbits are so afraid of humans um, that they will actually have health problems very, very, very quickly, or develop health problems very, very quickly. Um, if we took them in the pro onto programs, um, some of those pro times or some of those health issues might even be um, heart attacks. They're so afraid of humans that they actually um, will ha would have a heart attack um, just being in the presence of predators. Um, so that's why we use a domestic rabbit um, who has been bred for thousands and thousands of generations to be comfortable uh, around humans. So they can, you know, they're the common pet store animal now. A lot of people have them as pets. And so eastern cottontail rabbits are uh, very, very, very common. A lot of people think that they dig holes in the ground as burrows, but they don't. Um, so rabbits actually uh, basically tear up grass and find a divot in the ground. So think of a bowl. And that is where they have their babies. And then the moms will even, to make the bowl a little bit warmer and a little bit softer, um, rabbit fur comes out incredibly easy. And so mom, butt rabbit, will actually pull out the fur from her belly and kind of line the nest with her fur. And the babies grow up and develop very quickly. So after she has them, um, within a week their eyes are open and within four weeks they're on their own. Um, so they grow up very, very quickly. And mom has a nest of about usually seven or eight bunnies sometimes. Um, and that's because they are a prey item. They get picked off by pretty much everything. Um, and that's why technically rabbits can have a baby uh, or have a litter every four, it's either every four to seven weeks um, year round. Even during winter, they are ready to go. So sometimes we get bunnies during very odd times of the year. Um, when we are very least expecting it. Um, usually that doesn't happen, but if we have warm weather like we are right now, sometimes we can end up with a nest of bunnies in the middle of November. <laughs> um, and uh, bunnies, baby bunnies, oh my goodness, do they eat a lot. More than you would expect. So um, we are very dependent on our local Kroger. Um, it's just down the road. And some days, we feel awful, but some days, if you're really wanting to get some greens for a salad, um, there are none because we buy up everything in the store. 
um, to use and feed the animals here at the center, especially those baby bunnies. Um, we actually rely on people popping up uh, dandelion greens from their own yards and bringing them to us to feed these baby bunnies because they go through a lot. Um, and that's true for most animals. The babies, the young, go through twice as much as the adults. And so uh, we actually feed them multiple times a day um, when they're weaned. We take a couple of handfuls of um, some of their food, throw it in the cage, and by the end of the day we have to do it again because they just demolished all of it. It's gone. And so just thinking about them in the wild, they're eating a lot of plants that we would call weeds. So dandelions, clovers that people usually don't want in their front yard, that's what bunnies eat. And so if you let those grow, you're feeding a lot of bunnies. And they also would eat things like grass and native herbs. And sometimes they work their way into people's gardens, which, um, so sometimes we get to calls about nuisance baby bunny nest in uh, somebody's yard. Um, and I guess one interesting thing is that we get a lot of calls about people who have dogs but also have a bunny nest in the middle of their yard. And they're like, why in the world is this bunny? It can smell the dogs. Why is it building this nest in the middle of my yard? And there's a very good reason for that. Your dogs are only out for part of the day. They're not out all the time, generally. And so that bunny's making her nest in your yard because other predators, like coyote and fox, don't want to tango with your dog, so they're not going to come into your yard. So they're actually, your dog is protecting, or your dog's scent is actually protecting those bunnies, uh, which I think is very, very interesting. Um, and it's something I recently learned when I started answering hotline calls because we get so many that I had to be pulled for that, too. And a lot of another question I get are, what do eastern cottontails eat during winter? Everything is dead. So what are they eating? Do they hibernate? And they don't. They're awake year-round. And what they're actually consuming are um, vines. So they might eat some ivy. Uh, like poison ivy. We don't like that, but the bunnies will actually consume it, and it doesn't bother them. So poison ivy only affects humans and pigs, nothing else. Um, so that's something interesting. And then uh, bunnies will eat the bark off of trees, and they'll eat buds. So uh, if a twig falls, they'll eat the twig, and they might eat the buds of the leaves off of that twig. <laughs> He's being very good right now. I'm surprised. Normally he's thumping and yelling at me. <laughs> so Jamie, had, can you tell us a little bit about um, who cares for the bunnies at the center? Uh, and do you have to know how to do that if you're a volunteer? Uh, how, how does the day-to-day -day management work? Yes. So bunnies are very particular. Um, we are lucky enough to have a couple amazing volunteers who come in multiple times a week for um, our nursery. So we have a whole room in our center dedicated to baby animals. Um, we have a mammal nursery and a bird nursery. And for bunnies, we have multiple shifts, or for volunteers, we have multiple shifts for each nursery. So all of our babies are getting fed multiple times a day. Um, and with bunnies, though, it's a lot easier to care for them because they really only need two feedings a day. In the wild, mom bunny only feeds them in the morning and at dusk. And so we mimic that and we only feed our bunnies at, in the morning and at dusk. It just um, depends on how many we have to care for. So sometimes we might have 200 bunnies up in our nursery that we're caring for at one time. So we might start a little bit early um, in order to feed them or a little bit late. Or we're staying late to feed them. <laughs> Um, and then as far as our ambassadors, we have uh, volunteers who come in every single day to clean all the cages and feed our ambassadors and give them enrichment um, and just their day-to-day -day care. Uh, so like Roman, he's out of his cage right now, so his can be deep cleaned while he's not in it. So, and he just recently got a tunnel, so he does like hiding. Um, so if somebody donated their dog's their dog didn't like this little tunnel, so they donated it to us, and we're like, oh, we'll stick it with Roman and see if he likes it. Um, we were a little concerned because we thought it might smell like dog, 
um, which might freak him out a little bit. But nope, he lays in that every single day. It's the first thing he goes to um, as soon as we open his cage door, and he will stay there all day. He loves his tunnel. Um, but, yeah, so that's kind of how the day-to-day -day care goes. It's a lot more intricate than that um, because, like, with bunnies, um, when they're still on formula, we actually have to tube feed them. And that's not, thankfully, that's something I don't have to do because I would be terrified um, of sticking a tube down into their bellies. That's not something I'm comfortable with at all. Um, uh, yes, Jamie, um, <laughs> yeah. that, this is the perfect timing. So Brianna has asked, at your center, do you tube feed or bottle feed baby bunnies? Yep, we tube feed um, animals that are high stress um, because the longer you handle them, the longer or the basically the more time you have to cause them to get stressed out and have a heart attack. Or um, animals actually can die from too high stress. Um, so it builds up in their system um, and sometimes they just pass away from that. And so we do tube feed um, our bunnies because it's very quick. We stick it in there, put some food in there, and then we're done. Um, well, we also weigh them, too, before we feed them um, to make sure they're growing properly. Um, so we weigh them, feed them, done. That's it. We don't touch them anymore. Um, and so same thing with our opossums. We tube feed them as well. Um, not so much because they're stressed, but so they'll actually bite through the syringe. Um, if we try to uh, tube feed them, or not tube feed them, um, bottle feed them essentially. Um, we use syringes for that. Um, and then, what else do we syringe feed? Squirrels. So if you syringe feed those as well. <laughs> All right, you ready to go back in? So I'm gonna stick them in. All right, I'm gonna disappear from camera for a minute. <laughs> All right, buddy. Where'd he go? Oh, he's mad. He's thumping at me. Ah. All right. It takes me a minute to do his cage because he's very ornery, so I have to actually, um, I actually have to take the door off of his cage completely and then stick him in there and then put it back on because otherwise he it, he won't come out otherwise. <laughs> All right, and so for my last animal, she's another new one that we got just this year, um, but she's gone on many, many programs and she's kind of a, a favorite for this area. So she has a lot of fans. And she's probably going to be asleep, so I have to wake her up. Grandpa, good morning. Hello. Hello. Are you awake? There we go. All right. So here's Greta. She is our Virginia opossum. And she kind of liked my baby. Uh, so uh, when she came in, she was the size of my hand. And I, uh, when we got her, she was actually, so I'll tell you her story first. If she looks towards your direction, um, you'll notice one of her eyes are closed. Um, and that's because she was attacked by a dog, unfortunately. And she did lose her sight because of that. Um, so she's mostly blind. We're not sure if she's completely blind in one eye. Um, she might see shadows. It's very hard with opossums to tell because their eyesight is so poor to begin with um, that um, she kind of does walk into things sometimes. Um, she does have trouble with depth perception, but that's because one eye is completely gone. Um, but she does so well. She's very spoiled here. <laughs> um, and she loves smelt. Oh my goodness, she'll do anything for a piece of smelt. Um, but they are super good and for the environment. Uh, so not only do they eat ticks, which is typically what they're well known for eating in the environment, they'll also eat mice. Uh, they're opportunistic, so they'll eat carrion. 
Uh, they'll eat um, crab apples. They'll eat trash that's on the ground. Pretty much their nature's garbage man. They'll eat anything. <laughs> um, and there are a couple of really fun things about them. So opossums don't really get diseases. Um, so when COVID hit, she was one I was not afraid to take on programs um, because their body temperature is really um, too low to host many diseases. Um, so their body temperature is in the 80s. Uh, so things like rabies, they don't get um, unless there's the weird opossum that, you know, has a high body temperature. But that's super rare. Um, and uh, they are actually immune to a lot of poisons. So they can eat things like mushrooms and be just fine. Um, they can eat, or if they get bit by a venomous animal, like a snake. Usually that snake might end up as a snack because it doesn't bother her. Um, sometimes if the snake does really inject the venom into them, though, um, they might pass out for a little while. Um, but generally they're going to be fine. And actually, they are studying opossums to help create vaccines for um, venom if somebody gets bit by a snake. Uh, we do see a lot of opossums during winter um, that do suffer from frostbite. So opossums uh, don't have fur on their ears, their nose, uh, their hands. So their feet don't have fur on them and their tail. I don't know if you can see it, but she wraps it around me when I'm holding her um, so she doesn't fall. So their tail is pretty cool. So they have a prehensile tail. So that means that they can actually use it to hold on to things. They cannot use it to hang, which is what a lot of people think opossums can do because of um, TV shows and sometimes pictures might have an opossum hanging from the tail. Um, but they're way too heavy to actually hang from their tails. Um, so maybe a baby, if it has a strong tail, can do it. Um, but generally, an opossum, if they do slip off of a tree branch, um, they use their tail to hold on really tight, and they use their awesome strength to pull themselves back up. <laughs> um, their tails are incredibly strong. Um, sometimes uh, when I'm getting her out of her enclosure, she'll wrap her uh, tail around the cage doors, and I can't get her out unless I have somebody else working her tail off of the door. Um, so they are very strong and in the wild they use their tails to uh, pick up leaves and sticks and make a nest out of them. Um, they're very nomadic so um, you might see one opossum one day and think it's the same one the next day but it's not. It could just be another visitor. Um, they don't typically stay around the same area unless you have a bird feeder or you're putting out canned cat food or um, treats for the local wildlife then they might stick around a little bit longer. Um, there's so many, just so many cool things about them. Um, they're only marsupial in North America. Well, I guess I should say the only marsupial in the United States. Um, and she can have up to 13 babies. Uh, so I say up to 13. They can have more at a time. Um, but it's pretty much first come, first serve to um, the pouch. And she has 13 nipples. So um, the first 13 that get up into the pouch are the ones that survive. Um, and just like bunnies, they are a prey item. So hawks and fox and coyote do prey on them. But <laughs> she's drooling on my arm. <laughs> and um, so they are a prey item. So they do feed our raptors and animals that people do like to see, but then they don't like the things that they eat. And so one thing that people don't think about is, yeah, there might be um, mice in your neighborhood and so they put out a mouse poison but then that affects your hawks and other creatures that might be living around. It can even affect your house cats because sometimes house cats catch those mice. Oh, big yawn. <laughs> of course, I don't know if you guys could see it. She, I think she was looking at me when she yawned. It's my favorite part of a program when I take her out and she does her big yawn because their mouth um, opens so far. Um, Easily, my arm would fit inside of her mouth if she was angry, but she doesn't. So opossums, their um, flight or flight instinct, they're going to fly, or fly before they uh, decide to fight. And so opossums, when they play dead, 
the first thing that they do is they're going to run and then twist around really fast and hiss at you. Um, and if that doesn't scare you away, then the next thing they're going to do is they're going to start drooling and foaming at the mouth. And they do that to kind of make, uh, say, a fox that's coming after them think that they're sick. And a fox knows if that animal is drooling and foaming at that mouth, I might not want to eat it because then I might get sick. But say this fox is really hungry. So he still goes after this opossum. The next thing that they're going to do is they're going to play dead. And it's not something that they choose to do. It's something that instinctually happens. So like, uh, say, the fainting goats, if you've seen them before, um, how the fainting goats just kind of fall over sometimes. Uh, opossums have that same kind of instinct. They just faint at some point when they, um, maybe it's when their adrenaline or their stress gets high enough. And uh, what ends up happening is they also, when they, when they play dead, they release a horrible stench. Um, it smells like something's been dead for a very long time. And uh, that helps make the fox think, finally, um, that thing's been dead for a while. It probably is not good for me to eat. And so that's how they survive. Now, if that happens in the middle of a road on an oncoming car, that car might see them and think that they're dead. But then the following car might think that that animal's dead and might accidentally hit it. Um, sometimes they don't have control over when they wake up. Um, sometimes they can wake up right away. Sometimes it can be an hour or two later. Um, it just, I, I'm not sure. Maybe there is some scientific reason for how long they play dead. Um, I do not know that information. Um, but I can always look it up and find out later. It's actually something, I like doing programs because I end up making questions for myself to go look up and learn more later. Um, but they actually use, so they have a lot of whiskers on their face. It might not show up in the video. But they use their whiskers to kind of find their way around their environment. <laughs> so these guys are super helpful. And with all of these animals, really, how they help us, they can prevent us from getting diseases. They um, provide food. If they're a prey animal, provide food for our um, larger species of animals, so things like fox that people love to see in the wild, things like raptors that people just love to see, but they don't like the things that they eat. Um, they are just so cool to have around. They help us economically, um, not just opossums, but all these guys. They help us economically by not having to put as many pesticides out. If we have more of these species, we won't need to use all that um, mosquito spray because the bats are taking care of them. Or we wouldn't have to put as um, much uh, insecticide on our plants because the opossums are around and they're eating those things. And I didn't even mention, like, skunks or, um, I don't know, foxes or uh, coyote. All those animals have something important to give to us, and we can help them, too, by providing more natural areas uh, for bats, uh, setting up bat houses, planting trees. Um, a water source is very important for bats, so they like to... Um, well, if you think about it, mosquitoes lay their eggs in water and they lay hatch. So if you have a water source, then those bats might stick around longer. Our bunnies can keep our weeds down. Things that we won't have, a lot of people put um, weed killer out. If we had a lot of bunnies, we probably wouldn't need as much weed killer. Because after how much I've seen these bunnies eat, we definitely won't need weed killer if we have a lot of bunnies at all. Like, you just need a nest of bunnies in your yard and your weeds are gone. <laughs> Maybe your vegetables too, but there are ways to protect those. <laughs> she may, um, I have a sweatshirt on and the, the cord on the sweatshirt, she didn't know it was there and it scared her and made her jump. Oh. Where are you going? Um, well, this is wonderful, Jamie. Thank you so much for um, taking us uh, to meet several different animals and to help us learn more about them. Yeah, no problem. I always love teaching people about local wildlife. And the fun part is you don't have to go far to learn about these guys or to see them. They're in your backyard. That's exactly right. I know at Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society we um, have several initiatives uh, learning about nature through the lens of urban birding and, of course, uh, mm -hmm. birds, wildlife, and habitat. And it's amazing how much wildlife 
is right here, right around us. Um, you know, whether we live uh, ur uh, ur uh, urbanly or rurally or in the places in between. So mm -hmm. there's lots and lots of wildlife that surrounds us. Um, Brianna, do you have any other questions that you would like to ask or comments? Um, I hope that we see you again next Friday. And I want to thank you so much for joining us um, and everything. And so, Jamie, is there anything else you would like to add here? Um, not really, but I hope you guys come next week. It's my favorite animals next week are the amphibians and reptiles. Ooh. Big fan of those guys. So Very I will, good. I maybe so. I give too much information about those reptiles, but <laughs> more than you could ever want to know. Oh, well, that sounds like fun. So that will be next Friday, the 20th at noon EST. Um, and, uh, and before we go, I do want to just reiterate um, that uh, – supporting our wildlife rehabilitation centers wherever they may be um, and wherever you are is a really important thing to do. And if you would like to uh, send a donation, every donation is very welcome and it, you would be uh, supporting Nature's Nursery Center for Wildlife Rehabilitation and Conservation Education in White House, Ohio. And you can, two ways you can make a donation. You can make a donation in any amount uh, to the donate page on their, their website. And that URL is natures, N-A-T-U-R-E-S dash nursery, N-U-R-S-E-R-Y dot org. Or you can just mail a check to Nature's Nursery, Post Office Box 2395, White House, Ohio, Four three five seven one. So um, thank you so much again for coming and for this lovely program. And I wish everyone have a nice day. And uh, we hope to see you again. So thank you, Jamie. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Bye bye.